Joining me now, as he does every week, is the author of international bestsellers, including The Strange Death of Europe, The War on the West and The Madness of Crowds, the great Douglas Murray. Douglas, we'll get to the massive news from the US today, whistleblower revelations that the Justice Department tried to limit the investigation into the Biden family, including the president. But first to the UK, where a 13-year-old girl was called despicable by her teacher at a Church of England school because she didn't believe people could identify as cats. And Douglas, the teacher even said the student should find a new school and reported the poor kid to school administrators. Let's have a listen to the audio. Yes, it's is. not an opinion. Yes, it is. Yes, school. it is. No, it's not. And if you don't like it, you need to go to a different school. So I I'm, I'm reporting you to Miss Willis. You need to have a proper educational conversation about edu about equality, diversity and inclusion. Oh, I'm because I'm not that having that expressed in my lesson. Now, you had an exchange with a former Home Secretary, Priti Patel, about this story. Uh, tell me what your issue was with her and the Tories in general concerning this story, because Priti was pretty upset by what she heard as well. Well, one of the many things about this that disturbed me, Rita, was that the girl in question, th th this girl was 13, Mm. And she's having to argue with a teacher who is much stupider than her. I mean, this student was right, you know, but the the teacher had been educated into all of this, or rather indoctrinated into all of the stupidity of our era. The teacher was going on about gender being different from sex and that it was bigoted to say that there were only two sexes. I mean, I, where do we even begin with stupidity of this kind when it's coming from a teacher and having to be corrected by a student? But, you know, Priti Patel, who I've got a lot of respect for, former um, Home Secretary in the UK, um, tweeted out her disapproval of this. And it, by the way, this is just one recording of a number that have come out in this holy and most ancient celebrated month of pride in which British school children have been educating their teachers uh, about basic facts of biology that people seem not to want to teach anymore. Uh, but Priti Patel uh, rightly, you know, said, you know, this is terrible. I can't believe that this is happening. And, and I just pointed out to her, this 13-year-old girl has spent every year of her life living under a conservative government. Mm -hmm. How on earth it has this happened under even nominally conservative governments? How have you got teachers telling students that facts of biology are bigoted? I, you know, if this had happened under a weird far left wing Corbynite uh, government, I I'd understand it more. But how badly does a conservative government have to muck up to have this happen on their watch? It is deeply, deeply disturbing. And unfortunately, it's not limited to one school. It's schools up and down the country, public schools, private schools, state schools, the lot. The rot is everywhere. Absolutely. And you're so right about the stupidity and confusion of that teacher, because at one point she accuses the students of being homophobic, as if you're, if you're gay or lesbian, then you're non-binary and you're trans. I mean, it, it was just such a confused diatribe and the aggression and, and the bullying of those poor kids. To have a teacher in front of other students call your point of view despicable and say you should find another school, I mean, that is unbelievable unforgivable in my book. Um, now, let's go to the US. And in the week where Hunter Biden receives a pretty much a slap on the wrist for actions that would land others in jail for years, we have learned of testimony from two IRS whistleblowers who say officials at the Justice Department, at the FBI and IRS interfered with the investigation of the tax evasion case against Hunter Biden. The case has been hijacked with political considerations, with one whistleblower, Gary Shapley Jr., who was in fact the supervisor of the investigation of the IRS, saying that at every stage of the probe, decisions were made that had the effect of benefiting the subject of the investigation. Mm. And the key here, Douglas, is that the interference often sought to prevent investigation of the big guy, President Joe Biden, and any involvement he may have had in his son's uh, dodgy business dealings. 
it, it, it's it's so disheartening and disconcerting this rita you and i have talked before about the damage that occurs in a society when its institutions become uh, untrustworthy and uh, that has certainly been the case with the irs in the us i'm afraid it's also becoming clear that it's the case for the fbi in the united states and you could argue almost every institution you know uh, for, for years uh, politicians have said that to the electorate you know send me to washington and i'll drain the swamp mm. uh, but it turns out in most cases the swamp has drained them uh, and and they leave office uh, um, a shadow of their former self, and the swamp continues. There's nothing more worrying than the way in which, uh, in America at the moment, it seems that institutions can be used as political weapons. I'm thinking of things like, for instance, the uh, journalist uh, the t who, among others, uh, was one of the people who exposed the Twitter files, Matt Taibbi, mm. who for this... And in this week has revealed that the IRS has been to his house to investigate him because he's being politically difficult. Now, that is a sort of banana republic behavior. But the flip side of it is that if you are in the protected class, as it rather obviously seems that Hunter Biden is, you can get away with an awful lot. Uh, if, if, if Hunter Biden's surname wasn't Biden, mm. uh, he would be facing this slap on the wrist he'd be facing jail time and uh, as for the big guy uh, it seems very obvious that there has simply been an effort at the highest level to keep joe biden out of all of this uh, will that continue i'm afraid in politicized institutional in america that will all depend on who takes the white house next well, we do have a two-tier justice system in the US, it seems, and certainly trust in those institutions has absolutely plummeted. Now to a, another sign that we're living in a strange times. Two of the world's uh, richest and most influential men, billionaires Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, one owns Twitter, the other owns Facebook and Instagram. Douglas, they have agreed to fight each other in a cage match. I mean, tell me what is going on here. And who's your money on, importantly? Uh, well, uh, my money would be on Elon Musk, but I also hope that he um, uh, uh, knocks out Zuckerberg in the ring. Um, <laughs> Zuckerberg, I think, has been an enormous force for bad uh, mm. uh, in the world. As I think Elon Musk has been an enormous force for good. I, I don't say that lightly. I remember, you know, Zuckerberg has been one of those people who's been very happy to censor the free press, to decide what you and I are allowed to know or say on platforms. Uh, Facebook only recently that decided once again to silence uh, a, a, a column in The Spectator, England's mm -hmm. oldest weekly political journal. So the upstart company of Zuckerberg uh, um, seems not to have much of a concern about freedom of speech or access and inquiry. Um, Elon Musk, of course, has made his name particularly in recent years by saying he does think these things are, are important. So I hope that Elon Musk has got open source information that can show him how to cage fight. And I hope that Mark Zuckerberg's got an awfully limited uh, access to any such information. And I hope it plays out in the ring. <laughs> it might be the most watch uh, clash in ever. Oh, yeah. I mean, forget about Ali and Tyson and all the great fighters. This might break records. Now, something that you've written about this week, which I thought was fascinating, you call it the diversity racket. And you know that diversity was said to be one of the defining virtues of Britain, well, indeed, all of the West. But you've called it a trap. Explain why. Well, it's it's an important question to begin with, to say um, we're always told about uh, diversity and what an incredible um, advantage it is. And as I always say, there are some advantages, but the advantages run out fairly fast. Uh, they're, they're, because at some point, you, among other things, lose trust in your society, uh, societal levels of trust break down, you lose common points of reference and much more. But the diversity cult that has held sway in all of our countries in recent decades, particularly, I have to say, in Australia, uh, mm. goes along with the presumption that the more diversity you have, the more tolerance you'll have. Now, I've pointed out for many years, this doesn't work on its own terms, never mind any others, because the people forced into the diversity tent often get along uh, even worse than a couple of cage fighters with each other. 
And we've seen a very interesting case in the UK in the last week when a, a, a Muslim mayor of a town in the north of England um, uh, went to the ridiculous uh, raising of the pride flag uh, uh, event and uh, then had to apologize to his Muslim electorate uh, for doing so, and then was promptly fired from the Conservative Party, of which he's a member for doing so, and had to then resign as mayor, and then had to apologize to the LGBTQIA plus <laughs> whatever community. So this guy got buffeted from both sides of the diversity tent on this particular occasion. He got buffeted from the Muslims, buffeted uh, by the uh, by the rainbow people. And um, I said, this is absolutely typical, of course, because I mean, this man says, you know, it's, it's, it's against my religion. And um, well, yeah, I mean, um, the, the, the mayor's first name is Mohammed. Uh, the man he's named after wasn't famously in favor of gay rights. Uh, we don't know quite where the Prophet Muhammad, as he called himself, stood on the question of non-binary people, Rita, and I do think we have to keep mm. that in common, uh, in, in mind. Uh, but Muhammad was a pretty binary kind of guy, yeah. and uh, we don't know um, which flag exactly Muhammad used to ride into battle with to slay the infidel, uh, but it's almost certain, most scholars are, are agreed, that it wasn't a rainbow flag of any kind, uh, uh, let alone the one with the extra bits for T's and triangles included. So uh, no wonder this thing has broken down a bit. It's broken down for this poor guy, but it's breaking down across all the countries that have made the fetish of diversity. In Canada in recent days, it's it's been Muslim parents have been protesting outside schools saying, we want to take our children out of the gender nonsense lessons. <clears throat> in Los Angeles, uh, uh, parents at an Armenian school who mm. wanted to remove their children from, from LGBTQIA plus lessons, were, uh, were were getting beaten up uh, by uh, queer activists who, by the way, then had a schism because some of them thought that they should uh, attack uh, um, the Armenians and others thought it could look racist. So that's what it looks inside the incredibly confused mind of the Purple Hair Brigade. Um, but yes, this is this is one of the consequences of diversity. Not everybody in the diverse tent gets along. And isn't it amazing, Rita, that in none of our countries did anyone in government seem to realize that might be the case? We tried to warn them. I remember writing yeah. about this, oh, I don't know, almost 10 years ago, about the regressive left and these different elements that were eventually going to come to a clash because their values yeah. are so different. The only thing they really share in common is a hatred of conservatives, but apart from that, they share nothing else in, in, in their value set. And we're seeing the clashes, as you've just described now. Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. A great pleasure as always. Thank you.